Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show, where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. On today's show, I have as my guest, Marcel Pick. Marcel earned a BS in nursing from the University of New Hampshire School of Nursing, a BA in psychology from the University of New Hampshire, and her MS in nursing from Boston College Harvard Medical School. She is certified as an OBGYN nurse practitioner and a pediatric nurse practitioner. Marcel co-founded Women to Women in 1983 with a vision to change the way in which women's health care is delivered. In her practice, Marcel undertakes an integrative approach, which not only treats illness, but also helps women make choices in their life to prevent disease. In 2001, Marcel created womentowomen.com with a goal to inspire and educate women. Marcel has written three books, The Core Balance Diet, Is It Me or My Adrenals, and Is It Me or My Hormones. Her PBS show is... Is it me or my hormones is a favorite among viewers. On today's show, we cover many aspects of hormones for women of various ages. Because I've heard so many of your questions, I asked Marcel some very specific questions, and I think you're going to be excited to learn the answers to these questions. So whether you're a woman in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, or beyond, I think you'll take away some really great nuggets of information to help you have superior health and vitality. So please enjoy this interview with Marcel. On today's show, I have as my guest, Marcel Pick. It's so great to have you on, Marcel. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're talking about hormones and women's hormones specifically. And I know that you have a goal to inspire and educate women. That's a big goal for you, a mission for you. So let's start with that. What what has inspired you to be, have that be your big goal, your mission? Well, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, we started in 1985. Uh, Chris Northrup and I started a practice called Women to Women. And at that time, no one, there, number one, there were no all women practices around. And secondly, no one was really talking to women about how do they learn a little bit more about their own bodies. So since that time, both of us have taken it on as a mission to help women become more educated about themselves so that they can navigate the world of health, especially as they get older. And hormones are something that a lot of times people don't pay much attention to. If somebody goes and has, you know, they're one of their practitioners and asks them, you know, I think it's my hormones. I think something's going on. I want them to be checked. Most often they'll be told, look, they go up and down all the time. It doesn't really matter. And there's not a lot we can do. We can put you on the pill. And it's like, there's so much we can do. So both of us became inspired to make a difference. And it makes a huge difference when we sit down with women and understand what's going on specifically for them, because we're all very different. Our chemistry and our chemistry lab inside our body is very different for each person. So we have to pay attention. Right. Absolutely. I hear so many women come in to see me that are frustrated saying their doctors wanted to put them on antidepressants or sleeping medications. And really what they need help with is just balancing their hormones. And I say right. just because it's it's not simple, but right. it it is something we have to take a look at. And there's so many different aspects of hormones. So I'm so glad to have you on today to clear up some questions that I know my audience has. So let's talk about what it means to keep hormones in balance. What When someone's hormones are balanced, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, what's so interesting is I think a lot of people don't understand that the major hormones we actually have in our body are not estrogen and pedestrian and testosterone and DHEA. They're actually insulin, adrenaline, and cortisol. So these are the pieces that really make the difference for us. And if you change your diet, you can actually have a huge impact, believe it or not, because of insulin that affects your hormones. And people don't know that. I think it's very confusing. And also, if we have a lot of stress, we have a hormone called pregnenolone that usually makes progesterone, and it's pulled to make cortisol. And so you become progesterone deficient. So this notion of this imbalance can very much be affected by our diet our lifestyle, and also how much stress we have. So we can make huge changes just by changing our diet. And people are floored when they see if they cut the carbs and they cut the sugar that their hormones are more balanced. And, as, and also as they deal with stress because then progesterone is made and the hormones are more balanced. 
And when I talk about hormones, I usually talk about the symphony. And, you know, when I have pause and they want bioidentical hormones, I'm always looking at the orchestra. I'm always looking at, do they need some DHEA? Do they need some testosterone? Do they need, need some pregnenolone? Do they need estrogen, progesterone? And it's always a composite. And when I have people that are prior to menopause, I'm doing the same thing. So what is the balance of those hormones? Because it makes us feel not so great, as people know, with PMS. They feel horrible prior to their periods. Their periods come, it's like they have their life back again. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And you cut, touched on so many great things. Um, and you know, I have patients that come in and say to me, oh, my hormones are imbalanced. Give me bioidentical hormones. Or I think I need bioidentical hormones. I think I'm ready. And they don't realize that there's so much else you can do to balance your hormones besides just you know, taking hormone therapy or, or something along those lines that there is a lot you can do with diet and lifestyle. So it's so refreshing to hear you talk about that. And so what are some of the, let's just cover some of the signs and symptoms. You touched on a few of that your hormones might be out of balance. Let's start with that. You know, one of the things that I see a lot of times is uh, irritability or the kind of the notion of they're reacting like this when it should be like this. They're screaming at their kids. They're not sleeping at night. They have dry skin. They have irregular periods. They have um, real fluctuations in how they're thinking is, especially in perimenopause. It's one of the big things I hear from people. And now what I'm seeing more than ever is anxiety. I'm seeing much more anxiety even than hot flashes and night sweats. So it depends on where we're talking about what age group we're talking in regards to hormones. But, you know, a lot of people have been aware that stress affects our hormones for years. But medicine's not caught up with that for some reason. And now we're starting to kind of understand all of those things, diet, lifestyle, especially nutrition, plays a huge part in that a bit, especially if you have metabolic syndrome, when you're noticing that you may have polycystic ovarian disease, or you're starting to know your blood sugars are starting to kind of go up, or insulin levels, all those things are part of the orchestra that affects your hormones. So I kind of started the basics. I'm really looking at, so what's your diet like? Are there foods you're eating that you're reacting to? Let's get those out of your diet. Let's look at your lifestyle, but also let's look at internal stress. A lot of times we say, well, just reduce your stress. And my response is, well, if they knew how to do that, they would have done that a long time ago anyway. It's how do we teach them what is causing them stress? Because for you and for me, our stress levels are going to be different depending upon what our own story and history is. So when I see somebody, I'm looking at all those things, and I'm trying to address everything that they're coming in with, including looking at thyroid function. And I don't just look at TSH. I look at free T3, free T4 thyroid antibodies, and often we'll look at reverse T3. Because a lot of times you'll see the brakes being put on with a thyroid and people are not paying attention to that. So when I see somebody with any of the symptoms, dry skin, brittle nails that are, 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 you know, are brittle as well, I'm always thinking, is it thyroid? Is it related to other hormones? Or are we kind of looking at the orchestra together? And also adrenals. I'm going to be looking at cortisol levels as well because all of that for me is part of the hormone cascade. So when someone comes in to see you, what is the first thing that you do? Do you, you do a physical exam? You do, um, you do order some blood work? What, what are some things that people should be, should be asking for from their doctors or when they're looking for a new doctor maybe, what should they be looking for? Well, I always do a physical because I'm always looking at skin. I'm looking at eyebrows. I'm looking at nails. I'm looking at the tongue. I'm looking at the mouth. I, I practice functional medicine, so I'm always looking at those pieces to the puzzle. And then I'm going to be looking at hormone levels. If somebody's perimenopausal, I might do a saliva hormone evaluation along with cortisol levels. So I can look at DHEA, cortisol levels at 7 in the morning, noon, afternoon, and evening. And I can give an evaluation then to them about what's going on. I might do a food sensitivity test as well because a lot of times people will feel really irritable and it's actually gluten or it might be eggs or something else that's kind of compounding the problems that they're having. And if they have GI symptoms, I might do a stool test to find out what's going on in the gut because serotonin is produced in the intestines. And if the intestines are not happy, then they're not going to have the adequate amounts of, test, of uh, serotonin. So I'm always looking at the whole body, and I do a questionnaire, a pretty extensive questionnaire when they come in that's got many questions on it. It gives me an idea about what's that organ system, what's that body part that's having the most trouble. And then I might make a decision then as to what they do. Some of the tests are done at a local hospital, and some of the tests are you know, what we call specialty tests, that they might get the kit with them and take them home and then go and do the testing for that. 
Right. And you just mentioned something about serotonin and the gut. Can you touch on that a little bit more? Because that probably surprises people. What? what it, first of all, serotonin, it, explaining what that is, and then why that would be related to your gut. That's not, they're not anywhere near each other, right? Right. Well, yes, they are. Yes. You know, it's so interesting. I've been doing this for a long time. I've been talking about probiotics and the importance of the gut and the gut brain connection. And there, we're now finally seeing coming out in you know magazines as well as CNN that there's a direct relationship between our intestines and also our moods. So somebody that might be a functional medicine psychiatrist is going to be looking always at the intestines, at foods that you might be reacting to, the flora of the gut, bacterial overgrowth, because all those things impact serotonin. And serotonin is as our hormone that actually. A, she affects our moods. So when we take an antidepressant, it's many times what they call a serotonin uptake inhibitor. So it doesn't really in, in do more with serotonin, but it feels like it does because you have more available. Many times people are still somewhat depressed, so we add then serotonin, perhaps 5-HTP or something like that to help. If they get their gut happier, that can also help because serotonin is produced in the gut. And if their gut's not working properly, they might have bloating or gas, constipation, diarrhea, um, or just not be able to be comfortable digesting foods. And I'm always looking at that so I can repair that, so I can perhaps then get the serotonin balance a little bit better as well, which also affects our hormones mm -hmm. because everything works as an orchestra together to help people feel better. I'm looking at the whole body, not just one organ system. Okay. Okay, great. So, so let's, let's come up with like a, um, a fake patient. Um, say she's, um, 50 years old going yeah. through the change kind of, you know, definitely showing signs of menopause. What, um, what are some of the things that, um, you would do differently for her versus someone else and a woman that's younger? Uh, depends on what her symptoms are. I mean, I'm going to be getting a very careful, you know, kind of evaluation of what, what she's having. Is she sleeping well at night? What's her diet like? How much exercise is she getting? What's her body fat, you know, kind of composition? What's her muscle mass? I'm going to be looking at all those things as well. And I, I see a lot of women that come in complaining they've gained that 15 pounds in their abdomen. And it's, they're so frustrated because they're doing everything the same way. Because as we get into menopause, what happens is the body stores a little bit of extra fat in the abdominal area. Sometimes it's adrenals, sometimes it's something else. So I do a good physical on her, and I would also look at the possibilities. I'd probably do um, an FSH level on her to find out where are we in that menopausal cascade. Are we early, middle, kind of going towards the end? Some of these patients I might just put on progesterone because that's all I need to do is I see their cortisol levels are really off and their progesterone levels are off and I might just add progesterone. But the first place I generally start is with a diet, but I do have some people that come in and they want those bioidentical hormones and they won't go away without them. So I might do that as well, but I'm always changing their diet. I'm decreasing carbohydrates. I'm getting sugar out of their diet. Oftentimes I'll do gluten. Sometimes I'll, depends on who they are and how motivated they are. I might take other things out of their diet as well. And then I'll have them come back and we'll look at the results. I oftentimes do a two-hour postprandial insulin level to see if they're going to be kind of down the road having problems with blood sugar. I don't do, I do blood sugars as well. I'll do cholesterol levels and I'll do what we call a VAP cholesterol so I can look at particle sizes of cholesterol. And I'm looking at kind of the big picture. So what do I need to teach her now so that she goes down the road, not on lots of medications, and is going to be healthy kind of in the long run, getting her motivated to do exercise, finding a food plan that really works for her that she's comfortable with, not trying not to take too many things away for her. But many times people are so motivated, they'll do anything that I ask. Yeah, it's, it's true. And, and a lot of times by the time they come see you and I, people come see you and I, they have um, already, they've gotten to the point where like, I've tried everything. I'm, I've, you know, been on antidepressants. I've been on sleeping medications and, and I know that that's not what it is. There's something else going on. And so people usually, women are pretty, usually pretty motivated to, to make a change, which is great because we don't have to feel like aging is this really bad thing and we're always going to be tired and we're going to be overweight and we're not going to sleep at night. That's not true. You can go through this time, this change and feel great. And 
Oh, I'm, you know, my mom is 75 years old and she's still show jumping horses and <laughs> doing yoga and painting and doing all the things she loves. We're getting ready to go trip to Italy together. And, you know, wow. it, it's, it's one of those things you, you know, you look at aging as something you, you've got experience and knowledge and it's something we should enjoy, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I say to my patients is menopause is a wake up call, you know? It's a developmental milestone. Who are we? What are we going to do for the second half of our life and how are we going to get there? And I think you and I can be great examples for people about how do we kind of do this time in our lives in a different way than our mothers did or our grandmothers. Because our society feels so much about this menopausal time, oh, you old, dried up. And I mean, you know, it's like so not true, but people still have that concept in their minds and they don't have to feel tired. They don't have to have joint pain. They don't have to have no sex drive. They can have a great sex life. And, you know, those are all things that we can motivate our patients about because it's so true. Yeah, absolutely. And with with you doing bioidentical hormones, what kinds of, of treatments do you do? Do you do creams? Do you do gels? Uh, do you do patches, injections, I pellets? I, I, do all the, I don't do injections. I don't do pellets. Um, I do trochies, I do melts, I do drops, I do creams, I do gels, um, I do vaginal creams, combination of oftentimes testosterone, DHA, and estriol for creams. So it depends on where, how comfortable they are and what they want as to what I do. And I use patches. I mean, you know, some people want it at the pharmacy and then I'll do patches as well. So whatever works for them, I'll put into the protocol and then I'll see how well it works. Then I might tweak it or, you know, change it or whatever. So I do pretty much all of it. Okay. And I know there's some people watching going, what is she talking about? What is, what is, what's the difference between a patch? And some people are like, oh yeah, I have that. And I do this or I've tried that. And other people are like, what are these things? What is she talking about? So just kind of a little summary of what the different forms of bioidentical hormones, how they, how they come in different forms, how we administer them and how you choose to which one. Well, the great news is that for a long time, we didn't have any bioidentical estrogens that you can get at the pharmacy. And we have sprays now, and we have patches now that we didn't have before, and we have gels now. And that's amazing for so long. And many years ago, I, you know, everybody was always talking about the options, and now we have other options you can get at a regular pharmacy. The progesterone is generally the only one that's uh, bioidentical is prometrium. The problem for me is it comes in peanut oil. And so many people are reactive to peanuts. So it's not my favorite option, but I will use it if I have to. And then we have um, melts. There are um, melts, RDT melts, that you actually put in your mouth, usually at night, and it melts in your mouth. And then they also have trochies that are very, very small, and, but you have to kind of put them in the inside of your mouth. And a lot of people don't like them because it takes so long for them to dissolve. And there are creams that you can use. I usually put a combination of, of things in a cream, and it comes with a, usually a pump on it, so you know how many clicks to do for the amount that you're supposed to have. And then we also have gels um, as well, and it comes in dispensers, sometimes in individual syringes, depending upon who, what the pharmacy and what you want. And then I also have drops. So you have so many drops per whatever I've recommended for them in terms of estrogen and progesterone. So I really try to tailor it to their needs as well as what I see on the hormone evaluation. And I tend to go on the low side as opposed to the high side um, and get people feeling as good as they possibly can, as sexy as they can and sensual and all those kinds of things. And most people are pretty happy with the results along with the dietary changes, along with taking out some of the foods that might have been making them sick and looking at the gut if I need to and looking at the thyroid. So it's doing an overall and cortisol, dealing with the cortisol issues as well. There's so many things we can do for women now. What we laugh about, though, is in menopause, it's kind of lotions, potions, and everything else. And you know it might be part of it, but they don't mind. Yeah, it's, it makes such a big difference. And, and symptoms that it's definitely worth it. And so how much would you say you use a compounding pharmacy for or a regular pharmacy? Um, most of them are the compounding pharmacy, but I do more now than ever with the Obamacare changes. I'm having more and more patients ask for things like Divigel or Evamist or, you know, some of the, the patches, all of which you can get at a regular pharmacy. It's a little hard for me sometimes to kind of manage those because the amounts are, I don't have much flexibility in the amounts. So if I can get people to use a compounding pharmacy, I will. 
but I'll work with people in whatever way I can to help them get to the other side of their symptoms. And if they need to go to a regular pharmacy, we'll make it work. Great. Great. Excellent. And so now I want to give you another example of a different patient. Um, So say we have a 35-year-old woman who has had babies and she's feeling tired. She's um, just maybe having some trouble sleeping at night. Um, Maybe her cycles are changing a little bit and so what would you what would you look at for someone that's younger, obviously not ready for menopause because menopause is usually around fifty, right? Um, what would you what would you do differently? Well, in some ways, some things would be the same and other things ways would be different. My treatment would be very different. But I'd be looking at adrenals because a lot of times the mom is also working and has a relationship and doesn't have much time for herself. So I'd be looking at adrenal function, especially with the sleep problem. And I'd be looking at foods in the same way as well, depending upon if she had GI issues or not. And I'd be looking at hormones. I'd be suspicious that she might have a progesterone issue. Um, And then if I needed to just put her on progesterone, I would, depending upon what the symptoms were that she was having. So in some ways, it's similar. I'm going to be looking at the whole person, but the interventions will probably be very different. Unlikely, I'd be putting her on estrogen. Um, more likely, I might be putting her on some DHEA, perhaps, if she was really depleted in DHEA because of all the stress. And I'd be looking at some of the other sex hormones like free and total testosterone to see if that was a piece to the puzzle as well. So I think a lot of times 35-year-olds are multitasking. They've got so much going on because they're trying to do the kids and the family and, you know, they don't get much time with their friends and they're feeling and they get oftentimes sleep deprived. So that is one of the things that causes huge amounts of adrenal function that causes then a lot of hormonal fluctuations, as you know. I mean, you know, we see some of the same patients. So this is the kind of work that we do on a regular basis. Yeah. The yeah. beautiful thing is that we can get people better. I mean, the beautiful thing is we can see them like that and it doesn't take very much time to be able to turn them around to say, oh my gosh, look at these adrenals. No wonder you're so tired. And of course, I'd be looking at thyroid as well to see if there was a thyroid issue. Understanding that when people have adrenal issues, it actually can undermine the T4 to T3 conversion or basically the way that the thyroid works. And that can be a big piece to the puzzle too. Great. Great. Yeah. All, all great points. So let's talk about one thing that's going to be common for both, both of those example patients and that's food. How, how can food help? What are the right foods to be eating? You mentioned avoiding food sensitivities and, and foods that we're intolerant to, and that's important. What about the foods that we should be eating as women, in this sort of age range? You know, one of the things that I say so often is that food is the most powerful drug we had. If I had nothing else that I was able to offer my patients, if I could just get them to change their diets, it's profound the difference it makes for people. So I have people do as much color as possible. And if I can, if I can imagine a plate, I have the half the plate with bright, colorful fruit or vegetables only, maybe a little bit of fruit in there, and then protein and a carbohydrate. So it's really more that those are kind of like side dishes, so to speak. And I urge them not to do processed foods. So, you know, getting rid as much as you can of the, the white carbs and the white foods as much as possible and getting rid of processed and sugar. And if I could do nothing else, is just get sugar out of the diet it would be wonderful. You know, smoothies are a fantastic way to start the day using kale and some of the other greens in there, spinach or even some carrots if you want. But being mindful, if you're sensitive to carbohydrates, you might need to kind of be mindful of the amount of sugar that you have in your protein drink, especially with fruits in there. Um, And then also being aware that there's tremendous controversy about should you have a snack or not. I urge women, especially if they've got a very slow metabolic function, that they may need to do that. I might get them to get a Fitbit to kind of increase their walking or exercise a little bit with that as well. And it's mostly whole foods, colorful as much as possible, protein at each meal, cutting the carbohydrates down a little bit, especially if they're carbohydrate sensitive, which so many women are, and being aware that they also, and I say this to people all the time, eat foods that you love. Don't you know punish yourself. Don't get into this model of, you know, I can't have that, I can't have that. But find four breakfasts, four lunches, and four dinners that you adore, and always be thinking about preparing because moms are so busy, they then grab what's on the run, you know, when they're on the run and they don't eat the best foods because the choices aren't so great. 
So I'm, I'm always encouraging people, if you're going to make a meal on the weekends, make four, you know, double it, triple it, and then put it in the freezer and mark it. And if you can do that often, especially in the winter, then you've got some food for yourself and you have some healthy snacks. If you're really going to snack on something, you know, have some nuts or something like that and don't put the, you know, raisins in it or the fruit in it, but just keep it as a good quality nut. Do the nut butters and have celery around, have cucumbers around to kind of snack on as well. So that's basically what I try to do is but also encourage people to have foods that they love. What's their palate? What's the food that they really love to have? And color, as much color as possible. Okay, great. And so you're not saying you should be vegetarian or you should be paleo? You're Well, you know, it's a really good question. I think if I said anything, it would be more Mediterranean. You know, having really good quality fats in your diet, avocados, some of the great olive oils, using grapeseed oils for cooking because that can tolerate a higher heat. And what I've come to see in my practice is that anything in perimenopause, people really don't tolerate carbohydrates as well as they used to before. For somebody that's a vegetarian, in my, in my practice, and there's a lot of controversy around this, there's a couple of us that kind of laugh together because we say, I don't see people being able to do it long term. They do great for a while, and then there's so much literature, as you well know, from the China study showing that vegetarian eating you know, really seems to be the way to go. I don't see women being able to do it long term. That's just my practice, perhaps, but I don't see it. And why, is that, why is that? You know, I, I'm not really sure. I think for so many people that the carbs, if you become really uh, insulin sensitive, that the carbs really feed into that mechanism. And I've done a number of uh, workshops, and I, I did one for uh, one of the groups in New York for the raw foods, and I was in a, on a panel, and one of the other women who's an actress, and I was sitting there back going, what are we going to do? We, we can't support this way of eating, so how are we going to tell them that we think we need to have more protein? So we were just honest and said our experience has been that we've seen women needing more protein. And perhaps they can get away with vegetarian eating if they feel well on it, I'm totally supportive of that because I think we're all a little bit different. I don't know from my experience that one size fits all. It doesn't. I have some women that do better with a little bit more carbohydrates and I have some others that really don't do so well and they're doing more of the paleo Mediterranean. But I think we, we need to support women in my practice to find out what model works for them and how do we get them there. And if binging or if they're overeating or if they're doing any of that stuff, then I'm really interested in looking at what's the mechanism that's off, what's the neurotransmitter that's off, are they that person that's so sugar sensitive that it sends them off into this, this cascade of I can't get enough, or is there some emotional tide of wanting to kind of fill that black box that will never be filled with food because food's not the issue. So I'm always looking at all of those things when I'm seeing people for the first time. What's their relationship with food like? It's a great question. Because so many women have struggled with too much, too little, what's the right food to eat. They've been on every diet on the planet and they don't have a great relationship with food anymore. It's very much, you know, uh, a, a defense mechanism for them. Sometimes they'll go to certain things or won't go to certain things. And there's been a lot of denial for so many women as well as I can't have that. I shouldn't have that kind of thing too. So it's a big deal. I mean, food for many women is a big deal. Yeah, great. I Completely agree. And, and there certainly isn't a one size fits all. You can't, you can't say the perfect diet for everyone is this. It doesn't make sense at all that for, for everyone, they all need to be paleo. How's that possible? It just doesn't make sense. We're all so different. Our biochemistry is so different. So if someone is on um, a diet, what are some of the signs that it's not a good diet for them? What do you think other than food cravings, you mentioned food cravings, um, I think, is, was part of what you were saying. Uh, any, any other signs that, that maybe they're not on the right diet? Um, well, it could be many of the things we've already talked about. I mean, they could have skin that wasn't really good. They could have fatigue. They could have, you know, falling asleep after lunch. Um, they can have nail healthy because that can be, you know, zinc deficiency and many other things. So many of the things we've talked about are oftentimes related to food. Is it because their food that they're consuming is something they're reacting to or is their insulin too high or, you know, is that a food that they're craving because their neurotransmitters are off or because they've had too much of it in their lives or their gut's not healthy? So it's looking at all those, those things together to figure out for them what the problem is. 
And when I wrote my first book in 2009, I talked a lot about this whole notion of our issues are in our tissues. It was one of the chapters. And, you know, for many of us, food has became this fear-based object. And trying to get women to eat in a healthy way is oftentimes complicated and difficult. So I work with a lot of people trying to get them to understand what healthy food is for them. What's the food plan that really works for them? How do they feel? You know, if they eat this way, do they feel good? Do they have energy? Do they rebound after meals? Or do they feel like they're falling asleep? So a lot of times, too. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and ideally, this is all plays back into our hormones of so when we eat okay. healthy, our hormones oh are good. Um, what about and you've talked talked about this some but skin, our skin health and hormones What tell let's talk a little bit about the connection between that you mentioned dry skin and hypothyroidism. What about other hormones um, affecting skin? You know, I'm probably biased. I mean, I really see a difference in women that are on hormones versus not, um, especially past menopause. But there are plenty of women that have really healthy digestive systems that are eating really well, that are using lots of essential fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9s, and their skin looks amazing. Um, so skin is very much a reflection of what's going on in the inside of our body. If I see somebody with rosacea, I'm interested to look at the gut because it's not just a topical problem on their skin. It's related to inflammation and digestion. So skin is a great marker for me about how healthy their body is. And then you can make adjustments accordingly. So if they have great amounts of essential fatty acids and they're doing healthy quality fats, which affects the brain as well, all those things make a huge difference in people's skin and their complexion. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. it's what we put on the outside, but it's also really what we're taking on the inside too that makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if people are, women are looking at um, one tip they can do to help with balancing their hormones, what would be the number one thing would be a great place to start? Stop process, change your diet. I mean, if you're, you're, eating processed foods, be mindful of ha having protein and also having lots and lots of vegetables. I mean, the more, you know, antioxidants you can have, the better and cutting the carbohydrates down. I mean, that, that is standard for me and it, people are floored every time they do it. I'm sure you see it in your practice as well. It's like, oh my God, I had no idea that the food that I ate must have made such a difference. And it does. So the biggest tip would be Look at the possibilities they can make surrounding you. That, and we all have to eat, so it's not such a hard thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Except for the seduction of the sugar, which is the problem for so many people. <laughs> yeah. The breads yeah. and the sugars. Yeah. So, Marcel, tell us how people can find you. Sure. Where, where can people find out more about you? Sure. So I've written a couple of books, so they can go to Amazon and type my name in. I wrote a book called The Core Balanced Diet, Is It Me or My Adrenals, is it, and Is It Me or My Hormones? So those are three books. And they can also go to womentowomen.com, and all the information is readily accessible. I have lots of articles. I've written articles for a long, long time. And then we have a website with nutrients there as well. Great. And are you still doing the PBS show? Uh, the PBS, it still gets aired. You know, once you do PBS, it kind of comes when they feel like playing it um, years later. So, yes, it's still, but not actively. I'll probably do another one next year. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing to help educate women about their hormones and living healthy, vibrant lives. So welcome. <laughs> you too. And thank you for the interview. I'd love to have you back on sometime. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Marcel Pick. To learn more about Marcel, you can go to my website, drtrevorcates.com, go to the podcast page with their interview, and you'll find all the information about her and links to her website there. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the Spa Doctor podcast on my website or on iTunes so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you get your customized skin report at theskinquiz.com. Based upon the answers to your questions on the quiz, you get some great tips on glowing skin and vibrant health. It only 
It only takes a few minutes to, to take the quiz and it gives you some great information. It's all free at theskinquiz.com. Also, don't miss out on the latest tips and information on social media, on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter. Join the conversation, ask your questions, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.